Hi, do you hear me? Okay, um, let's start. Thanks for having me here. I'm glad to uh, present you my talk. And in this talk, I want to share my team and our company experience uh, in adopting GraphQL uh, uh, in our product. I call it snakes and letters, referring the famous game. I actually uh, used to know it as my childhood game, and I think it's rather a modern one, but uh, later I learned that uh, this game was actually invented in India a long, long time ago, and it represents a kind of fight of karma and kama, destiny and desire. There are some other interesting facts about that. Um, yeah, so let me uh, first introduce um, the company I work at. Uh, it's called Ambas. It's based in Berlin and Cologne, Germany. Uh, we are represented at German and European in general market uh, and United States market. Uh, and our product is an educational system for medical students worldwide, providing them a knowledge base and uh, exam simulation in order to prepare for exams and also to uh, learn their subject in the most efficient way. Yeah, so our mission is to make medical knowledge universally accessible and effective. Uh, yeah. And uh, we use GraphQL as a backend API since two years uh, for our React based application. It is still in beta. And we also started adopting GraphQL API for our mobile applications. We have four of them, like two for each platform. Uh, and that's actually proves the point of using GraphQL for such purposes to have like universal API layer for all kind of clients uh, without major duplication of logic between them. So first, maybe I want to ask uh, how many of you use GraphQL in like as a developer uh, building a product which exposes GraphQL? Great. Yeah, so then maybe some of these uh, facts or insights wouldn't be a surprise for you. Uh, yeah, but I want to share them. Uh, so first I want to describe a bit because I know that street credibility in GraphQL world is provided by the number of types and fields. So this is our statistics. We have about 130 types and about 700 fields. And our schema currently is about 2,000 uh, long. I, I collected this some time ago, so now it's more, uh, but you can get the idea. Uh, so how it began? Two years ago, we decided to make a change in our product. It used to be a old fashioned, uh, as the company is seven years old, uh, it used to be an old fashioned application where HTML markup is generated on the server and uh, uh, later enriched on the client with Angular and uh, some jQuery. And this approach actually uh, reached its limit. And it was really hard to maintain that. We started to have a lot of duplications in our code. So we decided that we need to have a technology shift. We did some research what are possible technologies on the market. Uh, and we looked at GraphQL. Uh, but this is completely new technology for us, so how we would uh, adopt this technology without major risk of uh, spoiling our product. Yeah, so in our product, some decisions were easy to make, but GraphQL was rather a tough one. And uh, we approached it, uh, yeah, and this is a first snake I want to introduce. Uh, it's not specific to GraphQL. It's actually in any new technology adoption. You don't really know will you benefit from it or will you just waste a lot of effort on it and then approach nothing. Yeah, so, and a lot of stories I hear from how the GraphQL technology was introduced in different companies. There were some enthusiastic developer who was saying, oh, GraphQL is really nice. It's really hype technology. I want to use it. Everyone is doing that. GitHub is doing that. Facebook is doing that. Facebook actually introduced that. Uh, yeah, but from the business perspective, how to evaluate the risks of uh, introducing this technology? Because there are some 
implicit ones which are not visible for developers. So our approach was that we used to have a regular meetings uh, with uh, trying to brainstorm some potential flaws of the technology and uh, the way we can use it. Uh, we had two technology advocates and two uh, guys who were rather pessimistic and uh, tried to find any disadvantages like reading online and, and so on. So after these brainstorming sessions, we uh, went to our developers' room and tried to build a proof of concept, either proving or uh, proving that this flow will not affect us or there is actual solution for this problem. And as I already mentioned, it was iterative. So we spent about four weeks in this back and forth. Uh, and I think it's totally worth it because we, was, uh, we were able to observe all major risks and were prepared for them. Um, but while doing that, we actually identified the first letter of uh, GraphQL. Uh, it, uh, yeah, there is a concept of a ubiquitous language introduced by uh, Eric Evans in the main-driven design. Uh, and GraphQL seemed to be this kind of language for our development process. So uh, this was the language between back-enders and front-enders and uh, technical product owners or product managers who were able to make some conclusions about functionality of our API just by reading the GraphQL specification or navigating interactive, interactive uh, documentation. Yeah, and this is an example how it works. So without even any commands which are provided by GraphQL, it's pretty obvious what, what is possible in this system, what kind of data can be uh, encapsulated in user profile, and what can you do, uh, like that you can invite user by email, and also user can be in three different states, which is represented by now. Yeah, and of course, it might be not that useful on small schema, but when your schema reaches uh, a big size and knowledge sharing becomes problematic between, uh, maybe you have like 10 teams and each of them works on their own part of functionality, so sharing this knowledge may be uh, another level of effort. Yeah, so this data can be represented as a schema file, as a domain specific language of GraphQL, but it also can be rendered in a lot of different representations, either uh, this kind of diagram or uh, interactive documentation, as I mentioned. Another thing which we were able to achieve and which were really helpful is uh, uh, static control of our types. So we uh, started our, there are two major approaches in GraphQL design. You can uh, have schema first approach or you can implementation first approach and then your schema later is generated from your implementation, uh, which have chosen the uh, schema first approach and uh, we ended up generating some basic instances and classes uh, and basically language entities from, from the schema definition. We used the library for that, of course, we didn't implement it ourselves. We used the library to uh, parse schema file into abstract syntax tree, and based on this abstract syntax tree, uh, we were generating uh, our basic files with no implementation. And later on, by extending these abstract classes, we were um, able to with the static analysis check if our implementation matches our uh, schema declaration. Uh, these are some details, how we mapped uh, schema entities to language, uh, language entities. Another helpful, uh, letter three, uh, was that uh, GraphQL is a technology that has in mind the same values as Agile methodology in, in the workflows, in the processes, because GraphQL designed in a way that it doesn't have final version. It is evolving over time. You can add more fields, you can deprecate older fields. And uh, this is nice for Agile development because we uh, don't have to cut and stone the specification, we can, with interactive process, uh, adding increments to it, and with that, adding increments to functionality of our service. And if we uh, maybe made some bad decision at some point, we can always deprecate and 
there is a lot of ways to migrate clients. There is a lot of talks about that as well online. What else uh, was useful in GraphQL API that uh, it also maybe as a may play a role of abstraction layer over your internal functionality. So let's say you go with microservice approach and you have a lot of functionalities exposed by your services, but then you have this one layer of GraphQL or GraphQL API gateway uh, which can adapt your internal logic and internal objects representation to something you want to expose publicly. Uh, and there is one single point of where you can manage that. So that's all good, that's letters. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, descriptions of these advantages online on graphql.org. Uh, but let's talk about snakes and problems we faced and in these two years while adopting this technology. Yeah, so one thing that uh, is kind of missing in the, the specification, uh, but can be implemented as an extension, uh, is a distinguishing between public and personal data. Uh, you can have logic which implements, uh, which restricts access to certain fields of certain objects, but you cannot really make a conclusion uh, which fields and objects are private and which are public by just reading schema, which is kind of controversial to the rest of GraphQL uh, specification. And there are some different ways to do that. There, uh, you can use some naming, con naming convection conventions. Um, yeah, or another way of doing that was uh, you can use just documentation, which is human readable. So, okay, you just write a command to any field that's saying that this field is only uh, accessible by authorized user. Uh, and also you can separate types and write types on this level. Uh, yeah, but that actually, it that's what we used for our schema design. So this knowledge, uh, this knowledge is kept uh, beyond the GraphQL specification and schema. Another uh, big question we were uh, facing was how we handle errors. And uh, because GraphQL specification actually has errors, right? But these errors are not uh, really machine readable. So they only have message. Sometimes, uh, depending on the library implementation, they have extra fields. Um, and I mean, this doesn't look like a good practice to parse error messages or to uh, display them as is to the end user, to the client of your application. Uh, because then you will have all kind of questions with localization of that messages, interpolation, and uh, one big question which stays uh, on agenda, how you make, uh, how you implement the special handling of special errors. For example, some errors just block your view in the client, some errors maybe have some graceful degradation of functionality. Um, yeah, and GraphQL doesn't really uh, offer anything to extend the error uh, schema. It doesn't have error type or something. Uh, it now has in specification um, extensions field where you can put some custom codes and that's actually what we've done for global errors. But with GraphQL, you have to remember that uh, your query and your response is a graph and it can be partially uh, served successfully and partially cause an error. And in this case, uh, there is another problem where for the error, you need some extra information. For example, if the user cannot be read, there's uh, a question why it cannot be read. Maybe it's missing, maybe it's banned, maybe it just blocked you as like in social network. Um, and with this, there is an approach of uh, union return types where instead of returning some uh, exact type, you return a union. And then you have a regular type which represent, represents successful handling of your query and some error types uh, where you can provide additional information why with this request wasn't that much successful. Yeah, this is an example. Uh, so instead of just returning an article by ID, we uh, return an article result, which is a union of article type, which is a successful response, and uh, two potential errors. And just for example, one problem that can happen is quota exceeded if you have limited access to the content. 
and uh, maybe your subscription expired. Um, another uh, really popular misconcept is introducing mutation for authentication, for issuing a token, for example. It, it actually works, uh, but it's not intended to be used like that because there are some corner cases uh, which which you have problems with implementing in, in GraphQL and namely uh, that's for example all out callbacks because they only support redirects and um, yeah HTTP and GraphQL specification is not really bound to HTTP you can use sockets to transfer requests and response although using it over HTTP is pretty popular Caching. Caching is uh, one of r really uh, popular topics in the GraphQL world and uh, it was one of the first uh, topics in our discussion of uh, like this iterative approach of uh, identifying risks because as you know in the HTTP uh, world in RESTful uh, applications uh, you can use the power of uh, e-tags or uh, HTTP level caching, right? Um, which are obviously not available in, in GraphQL, uh, but that's by nature because uh, in RESTful uh, approach, you know that one request stands for just one resource. And this resource never changes uh, unless your version of API changes, which is usually the part of resource locator. Uh, so it's really easy and straightforward to cache it, say that, okay, this resource haven't changed since five days. So if you have fetched it uh, after that, then you don't have to retrieve it again and parse it again. And that's something which is which GraphQL is often being criticized for. Uh, oops. There should be another slide. But uh, I would say that uh, the solution here would be you shouldn't treat GraphQL as REST. You, your GraphQL layer should be really thin uh, layer with no state, which you can easily scale horizontally. And you can implement this HTTP caching or even data layer caching between GraphQL API and your service API. And also, there is uh, now in the reality of having technologies like React and other modern uh, front-end framework, you can uh, use client-side caching a lot. Yeah, so all these letters and snakes were, uh, were reasons to decide for or against that technology, but we ended up choosing GraphQL. Um, and we haven't regret since then. Uh, we keep evolving our schema and our implementation. We are abstracting our services. And yeah, the community is always helpful in GraphQL world. There is a lot of open sources companies uh, and like Apollo. And there is some companies in uh, Berlin as well that can share their experience with uh, their implementation. So that's it. Um,